Welcome back into the Sports Source. This segment brought to you by Southeast Termite and Pest Control. They are out there, folks, the fall invaders. That's box elder bugs, stink bugs, ladybugs, and they're all trying to find their way into your home right now. Do what I do. Trust Southeast Termite and Pest Control in their fall invader treatment. It works. I can vouch for it. I used to, uh, before I got with these guys, I used to have ladybugs galore every spring because they came in in the fall. Uh, it would be a mess. No longer. Not since I've used their treatment. Southeast Termite and Pest Control. All right. I want to welcome in, welcome in the next two members of our panel. We have right here from The Athletic, Mr. David Ubbin. David, I haven't seen you since you won your... your Big award, uh, <laughs> what was it, Football Writers Association yeah. of America? Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. Honored as Appreciate the, it. One of the best up-and-coming journalists in the country, I believe it was. Or was it, you know, just great guy? <laughs> uh, and then right next to you, great guy, former VFL, Sterling Hinton. Sterling, thank you for joining us. That'd be it, John P. Okay. Uh, I just want your takeaways. Uh, you guys haven't had a chance yet to just come in and give me your thoughts on the game. Your thoughts on the game? Well, you know, Missouri's not a great team, right? What do good teams do against not great teams? They dominate them, and they say, we're better than you. We're going to spend 60 minutes proving that. And Tennessee did that. You know, Tennessee now has won two of their last three SEC games by at least 18 points. From 2010 to 2018, they only did that six times. You know, that's, that's a pretty good sign. You're starting to play the Vanderbilts and Missouris. Nobody's going to be impressed if you beat those teams, but if you roll over those teams like Tennessee's been doing, that's a pretty good sign. And, of course, now you have a, a real test in Georgia, and we'll see. Thoughts well, on the game? I, I, I love it. What a difference a year makes. I mean, <laughs> we're 2-0 now, baby, in the SEC at that. So I, I'm excited about what I saw yesterday. I saw a team with some more cohesiveness. I saw an offensive line bench pressing the defensive line off the ball. I saw a quarterback with some more time to throw the ball. And I saw a lot of quirks that we threw out there on offense that we didn't show in the South Carolina game. So I saw a growth of a team and a growth of uh, some offensive calls from the coaching staff. So I'm excited about this week against Georgia. Josh, what stood out to you? Well, you know, to Sterl's point a year ago, it's Georgia week and Tennessee is about to fall to one and four and there are all kinds of questions about where is the program headed, how is this team going to respond, what's the mindset, who's going to play quarterback because Jarrett Garantano has lost his job a year later. He secured that job. And I, I think a reason for that is really combining Sterl and, and David there is that Tennessee has found a way to be consistent while not being perfect, and nobody's making that claim, I don't believe. Tennessee has an eight-game winning streak, and while the opponents are not incredibly impressive, Tennessee, within a game, it deals with adversity and figures it out. Yes. Look at Mississippi State. It wins at LSU to open the season, then turns around and loses to Arkansas. Finding consistency in college football is very difficult. For the most part, Tennessee has it right now. Yeah, when you're looking at eight straight wins and six straight in the conference, uh, they're finding ways to win. And four of those, as we mentioned last week, one position game, uh, one possession game. So yeah. uh, whether it's uh, always beautiful, whether your opponent's always the best in the world, the job is win the game. Win and the they've game. been winning them. So. Yeah. Uh, let me talk to you about the, uh, the line of scrimmage. Uh, they have been recruiting hard, offensive and defensive line. Again, Missouri... Uh, doesn't have, I mean, this is a team that's kind of bereft of four- and five-star recruits on their roster. But uh, it looks like your offensive and defensive lines, that work that you're doing in the recruiting uh, field, starting to pay off. Especially, you know, the jumbo package that they use time and again. Yeah, props to them for, for creativity. You know, Austin Pope, they don't have him for, it sounds like, most of the year. They know that they don't have what they need at tight end. So their answer is... Well, let's just put a ton of offensive linemen out there. You know, they went they went with a similar, you know, two tight end set, but instead of tight ends, they're putting Riley Locklear, who started at guard a bunch last year, and Cooper Mays, who's slightly undersized, but a really talented, really smart, true freshman. And they're rolling those guys out and saying, we're going to run behind you guys. That's some unbalanced lines. And, and that's, you know, credit to, to Jim Chaney and the offense for figuring out a fix with, with you know, no Austin Pope. And they're just going to go power. And, you know, seven offensive linemen, as Trey Smith said yesterday, that's a lot of meat to handle. And, <laughs> I mean, you start adding that up, that's literally a ton of offensive linemen. You rarely see that anywhere but the goal line. Yeah. I mean, to see seven offensive linemen out there uh, elsewhere on the field is unusual. Uh, it's a line of scrimmage league. Pearl, as much as you want it to be a quarterback league. I want it to be. It's a line <laughs> of scrimmage league. Yes. So for Tennessee to be, and, and these are young guys. They missed a lot of time with the quarantine, so you would, you would anticipate, barring quarantines moving forward, contact tracing, you anticipate them getting better. 
the future looks bright along that line of scrimmage on both sides, I think. Well, I, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm excited about, especially the, the improvement the offensive line has made between where we are now and just imagine where we were two years ago. Um, you know, and, and I'm excited to see, you know, uh, you know with all the time that, that JG's had back there that even, you know, Coach Pruitt believes he should have more time back there. So, uh, and I'm quite sure he's like, wow, it's, just, it's night and day, two different sets back there as he's throwing the ball compared to what it's been in the past. And uh, so I'm excited about the future of this team. Like I said, we're 2-0. and And I know the competition has not been what's coming, but neither was last year's start. Right. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Uh, Jared Garitano uh, told the SEC Network crew that he had never felt more comfortable than he did at South Carolina. Uh, Josh, I would think that uh, he was attributing that to years in the same system, first time he's been in the same system for two years, years with Jim Chaney. I would think having an offensive lineman that does a better job of keeping you upright also helps him on the comfort factor. Has to uh, go back to 2018. I mean, just a, a ton of times over the last couple of years. Even last year, there were still issues with the offensive line. They're just so much better. And I think Jeremy Pruitt coming in realized we've got to improve things along the line of scrimmage. I think that was the most important task for him to take on. I think it's the most impressive job he's done recruiting. When you think about guys like Wanya Morris and, and Darnell Wright, those are highly touted guys. We'll see how they develop. Uh, but also the transfer market. Brandon Kennedy and Cade Mays, which is a unique circumstance. But we're about to enter a more active transfer yeah. time in college football. Offensive linemen in the future will see what's going on at Tennessee, and if they're on the market and Tennessee wants them, Tennessee will have a really good recruiting pitch. Yeah, nice. I, think you, I think you look at that group, one hurry, two sacks, one on a scramble for like a one-yard loss, and one where, you know, Garantano kind of just like fell backwards. He was, he's not taking those kill shots, and that, that's, that's huge. That's, that's a, huge. a huge help for him. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he said at South Carolina he was bracing for hits that never came, and right. now, he's, now he's getting comfortable being comfortable, which yeah. is new. <laughs> the, the fire will friend crew from from 2018 a little quiet i mean the, the x's and o's jimmy's and joe's uh nonsense when you start getting a bunch of really good players in there turns out your offensive line looks a little bit better yep. it's funny how those things change <laughs> i saw somebody yesterday yeah. talking about jeremy pruitt being the best coach in america and i thought <laughs> i ought to go check this guy's twitter feed after the georgia state and byu games last year yeah uh, and will friend he didn't have any friends two years no. ago, but it is didn't have to many change offensive here. linemen either. But it turns out he's got them. All right, let's talk about next. Coming up next, I want to talk about uh, the offense. Uh, I liked the run pass numbers yesterday, but Tennessee still, Tennessee still looks like a deep ball, take your shots offense to open up the run team. Is that what it is? And is Garantano ready for a road game at Georgia? Come on back on the Sports Horse. Hey, when you're away from home, catch us on Facebook Live, our YouTube channel, or on SportsSource.tv. Let's do it. This is the Sports Source.